Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. Welcome, welcome everybody for uh, today's Tubman talk. Um, it is actually our last Tubman talk of the semester. So I'm gonna leave you a lot to think about today. I'm Dr. Bianca Beauchemin. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. I'm a member of the executive committee here at the Tubman Institute and the co-coordinator of Tubman Talks. Uh, Tubman Talk, um, is a space and a platform to share research and publications with audience who are doing work related or who are interested in Africa and African diaspora studies. The Tubman community is interdisciplinary and we welcome a wide range of topics and backgrounds. Uh, here we're intended to provide an opportunity for individual scholars to critically strengthen their own research by presenting it to others in the spirit of engaging in debate. Before we begin, I'd like to start us off with a land acknowledgement. Um, I wanted to acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tukurano has been taking uh, care taken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. I acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Union. This territory is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Bell Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. In, in making this land acknowledgement, I honor and acknowledge the land and its people who have been here for thousands of years. So today to begin, uh, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Debbie uh, ebanks Schloom. She is a Vanier scholar and multidisciplinary artist in the cinema and media studies at York University. Her doctoral research explores methodologies of archiving the Jamaican diaspora through storytelling and media installation. Debbie is a Jamaican Canadian of African and Hakka Chinese descent and is a student researcher with Archive Counter Archive, the Center for Research in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean and the Harriet Tubman Institute here at York University. Debbie has published in the Journal of Interdisciplinary Humanities and co-authored um, articles and book chapters with the art collective Odemine Runners, an interactive film and media journal, and interactive documentary decolonizing practice-based research. Today's talk, Jamaican Diasporic Archives, um, addresses the chasm between institutionally sanctioned archival report, records, pardon me, and the methodologies of archiving the Jamaican, Jamaican diaspora in Canada. She makes the argument for the preservation of a more accurate, culturally reflective embodied archive. The research asks, what are archives in the Jamaican diaspora in Ontario and how are these records preserved? The presentation will give an overview of the research to date and detail the ways in which seed funding from the Harriet Tubman Institute helped propel the community research creation project and recognize the contribution of participants. So please join me everybody in welcoming Debbie E. Banks Schroom as our uh, presenter today for the Tubman Talk. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boschman, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you for those of you who came uh, in person, as well as those on Zoom. I, I recognize a number of names there, some of which who are participants. Hi, Gertrude. Uh, and perhaps even a cousin of mine, friends, Jess, I see you. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I think Shaughnessy's here as well. I can't see all the names, but I appreciate you all. Um, I'm excited to share an overview of the research so far, and especially within this space. There's a legacy that comes with the name of Harriet Tub Tubman, and I just want to honor her memory as a guiding light for all the research on Black communities in Canada, for which this institute is a kind of home. And I'm pleased to share my progress today to invite your feedback and questions after the presentation. So I'd like to do a personal land acknowledgement as well. I'd like to thank the Indigenous communities I've been in relation with, and in particular, my co-mischief maker, Adrian Coggy, and O'Damon Runners Art Collective for sharing knowledge and stories with me. Um, while working on a filmmaking project in Adrian's community, Saudi First Nation, I was alerted to the ways in which uh, Black diasporic cultures share similar practices of record keeping 
when Kagi referred to the archives of Indigenous people, Indigenous peoples as stories. So in other words, the documentation of history and culture in Indigenous communities is done with oral traditions. And that shifted my thinking about stories um, as archives in and of themselves. And it made me realize how colonized my own my perspective was on my own culture. Um, because I didn't really think, I, I guess I didn't value those stories as much as I, I did at that moment in time when she um, mentioned that. So in acknowledging the land I'm a guest on, I'm also acknowledging a deep gratefulness for the knowledge sharing I've been privileged to be a part of and a deep indebtedness for my livelihood that depends on living on this land. And, um, oh yes, <laughs> don't forget my slides. I'm used to doing this on Zoom all the time, so now I'm in person. So uh, by way of, and this is just an uh, artwork that I created with O'Damon Runners. Um, so, and I'll come back to that later. Um, this is my family, or some of my family. Uh, th this research and this talk is in part inspired by a desire for cultural recovery, including language loss of Hatwa. My body, my perspective, and my self-identification have a specific history that inscribes my place within the research as an insider-outsider. I'm a Jamaican-born Canadian and describe myself as having a Black interiority. I self-identify as Blacka, Black and Hakka Chinese. It's a neologism I'm I'm kind of experimenting with. <laughs> Hakka means guest. And I take that position to heart as someone traveling on this land. How might I unsettle colonial Canada? My African and Chinese ancestors locate me within Caribbean legacies of enslavement and indentureship and coexist alongside British and Caribbean indigenous ancestors. I acknowledge the ways in which lighter skin tone accrues privileges in Jamaican and Canadian societies, regardless of the level of economic position. And though I was brought up in these entangled cultures, I was socialized in Canada and specifically when it came to racism, but also in my own sense of self, only my blackness mattered. So this is my family. Um, this is my dad, this is back in the seventies after we just arrived, my mom. Um, this is when we first went back to Jamaica after almost 20 years and visited my sister, me, my dad, my aunt, grandma, my grandpa, my mom, and another sister. So you can see we're just like, um, you know, we're so many different kinds of people. Uh, my my mother's grandmother, uh, myself, my dad, uh, my, my parents, myself and my sister, and this is my father's grandmother. So they're just from my own personal archives and also pictures I've taken from um, uh, uh, photos that my parents still have. I might be going off script a lot. <laughs> so I'm also a multidisciplinary artist, curator, and scholar. So I'm trained to see the world analytically, synthetically, and aesthetically. And as a figurative sculpt sculptor, I pay attention to the body and its micro movements. As a social practice artist, I uh, seek to mitigate power differentials and open up art and scholarly spaces for community. And I'm also a film programmer, so I pay attention to how different works or stories speak to each other within, within a space in a public. So this comes into, all of this comes into play within the research creation project, which is the co-creation of a counter archive um, with members of three Jamaican communities, one of whom is here that I can see. Hi, Gertrude. <laughs> And it's and the archive is tied to their diasporic memories and quotidian experiences. The research will culminate in a media art installation, a shorter written dissertation, and an open archival collection deposited to the Clara Thomas Archives with special collections. And so my research questions asked, what are archives in the Jamaican community? And more specifically, how do we preserve our records? I think of this research as archiving two ways, preserving the material records through digitizing um, and also preservation in traditional archives. And then secondly, by documenting the embodied preservation methods and records of the community on film and audio. So I'm thinking that the body is also a source of preservation. Basically I'm assembling rather than creating the archive with community. Although a portion of the records in the community will be donated to the Clara 
Frederick Thomas archives and special collections here at York. The bulk of the archives remain in family and personal collections in basements, attics, storage facilities, and living rooms. And so, um, and the reason that I'm thinking about these uh, embodied archives is because um, since enslaved Black peoples were historically forbidden from education and therefore from the scribal activities that would have preserved their perspectives in the colonial archives, I argue these embodied methods continued post-emancipation and into the present even now. And that evidence of the retention methods of oral traditions, um, uh, if not the con and that, that there's evidence of these oral traditions and not the content. And these oral traditions are at risk of disappearance because of hi everybody, <laughs> because of migration, modernization, and digitally oriented lifestyles. Widely mobile digital technology mitigates the loss by extending oral traditions to a wider public. And I think for many of us, we're learning about our histories by looking at social media. But the problem is that these audiovisual records remain at risk of deletion and digital degradation. So they're actually less. Um, they're less, they're less um, preserving, preservable quality than, than um, materials. So my research focuses on the time period of post-independence Jamaican migration to Canada, the late 20th century, from about the late 60s to the, uh, um, but six, the early 60s to the late 1980s. And it's a period that marked a significant wave of immigration from the island. Uh, due to political violence and economic conditions in Jamaica, as well as immigration policies in Canada. That's a short uh, explanation. As elders of the post-independence mass migrations pass on, much of the knowledge of this period of Jamaican immigration to Canada wanes. The lived experience of arrivals, such as myself, who came as a child, remain unpacked, dispersed, and disjointed. The period also marks a time when recording technologies such as tape recorders and handheld camcorders became more widely available and affordable. And though video camera cameras were presumably, um, um, were, though video cameras were presumably still rare for the average family and, um, oh, sorry. But at the same time, video cameras were presumably still rare for the average family and film cameras even rarer. Um, we never had a film camera, we just had a regular photograph camera. For instance. In other words, the presence of home movies in this community is not as widespread as other communities because of socioeconomic reasons why Black families earn less money here. While small community memory institutions and historical society, societies addressing local Black histories exist in Canada, there's no dedicated museum or archives addressing the wide presence of Black people on a provincial scale. Furthermore, historical records of the migration of Black Caribbean peoples exist as sporadic, disconnected collections across the Archives Ontario, Toronto Archive, Municipal Archives, as well as the Parrot Thomas Archives here. And, and also these very specific communities are swept up into larger categories of immigrant or Black without an understanding by mainstream society, never mind archivists, of the complexity of each cultural identity forming category, although this undersight is slowly changing. And research projects such as the newly formed Mapping Ontario Black Archives, Cheryl Thompson, um, att attest to the need to connect ar archives across this provincial geography. So I locate my research within uh, models of counter or community archives. Um, and I'm affiliated with the Archive Counter Archive Project as a research associate. Um, there's also Jacqueline Stewart's Southside Home Movie Project from Chicago that collects um, mostly films from uh, Black communities there. Um, and it engages the community um, in, through, in the archiving process and in the exhibitions of it. And there are important Caribbean models um, regarding Toronto music archives that include Mark V. Campbell's Northside Hip Hop Archive, the exhibition Rhythms and Resistance, Elena Stewart's Toronto Dance Hall Preservation Project, Rewind Forward, and Jinsaba Javi's Building a Black Archive. And so while these Toronto-based archives lack the security and longevity of a custodial relationship with official archives, they do avoid the colonial baggage of associating um, with traditional archives by keeping the collections in the community. So there's this tension between the colonial archive and the community archive. 
and that leads to my theoretical frameworks um, of the counter archive. And Paula Ahmad talks about how audiovisual records, and she was looking at film, um, celluloid film in particular. Um, no matter if you're what subject you're uh, filming, you take in all of this background information. So you get um, the 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 gestures, um, stories, dance, all happening in the background, the lit space. Uh, photographs do this too, but you have the moving image, um, which creates another um, kind of affect as well and other information. And so this is a way to make visible, um, make other communities visible. And I just had this experience recently. Uh, there was a film student looking at York student fil uh, film students here at York from the 1980s. And within their filmmaking, there were like um, students in the background. And so there were actually some, you know, a whole group of black students in that film. And then you just kind of wonder like, are any of these from the Caribbean or any of these from Jamaica? So it's just like all the background information is so important. And then I look at uh, Jeanette Bastian and Stanley Griffin who are uh, Caribbean archivists. And they talk about a community of records so the community creates the records. And Stanley Griffin, I, I love what he says. He says that the archives of the masses are found in the noise. So the rhythms that are executed on drums, dance, language, and all of these that characterize Black Caribbean life and the celebration of life. And so Bastian and Griffin regard these performative archives as a necessary intervention into the textual and image-based notions of record keeping. And finally, I've touched on this before, embodied archives from Diana Taylor, um, the body as a repository for memory, but also as a vehicle for um, the transmission of the archive over generations, which she calls the repertoire. So through dance and celebrations, um, uh, you're performing the memory. Um, And I'm um, doing some historical research as well. So looking at um, everyday performances um, and celebrations that happened um, um, during uh, the days of enslavement and, um, and how that's continued on. Uh, so Stanley Nia, Sonia, Sonja Stanley Nia talks about limbo being a dance that started on slave ships and um, continues on into dance hall movements. And so that's how I'm thinking of the body as being an archive. It, um, it's not just the, it's the oral history, but it's just the movement that you might not even know what it's about. Um, and so I'm gonna play a video. Uh, let's see, yeah. That tells you, um, that sort of shows you. So the first is an archival video and it's, um, and they're workers cutting sugar cane. And then it leads it to Latanya style. But now the okay, I'm gonna have to sorry. Uh, does need my <laughs> my volume from the computer. Um, I just can't see the zoom on. I hope this works technically. Let's try it. Sang bang bang badang badang dup, bang 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 badang badang dup. Sang bang bang badang badang, brrrr, bang bang badang badang bang. So the tiny style, style oh, sorry. The style goes all over the world. I think she was in Australia there and um, performs these dance uh, uh, the dance movements. Um, but you could see that uh, dance hall. Oh, sorry. Now this is showing. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so you could see uh, in the dance, there are people who are commemorated. There are events like earthquakes uh, uh, commemorated um, and as well as you know, labor, different, you know, all different kinds of things are in the dance. And I don't think I, I was that aware of it before. Um, and then the other uh, theoretical framework that I'm using are Black Caribbean feminism and this idea of future now um, from Andrea Davis. And that brings in this ethics of care and intersectionality, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, as well as Janet Momsen's, um, there's some, the matrifocal and the matrilocal in Caribbean feminism in particular. So I, I really do, and this is just the way, I don't know if it works for everybody this way, but I think it, it is, I have to work through the women to work with community. They have to vet me um, and they, you know, they kind of just arrange things in the background. Um, so, and that's just how things work. <laughs> and also there's this element of care um, that I think comes from um, being a, a Caribbean woman, especially like having food available um, for participants. And that's where Harriet Tubman has been instrumental in providing the funds to do that and honoraria for participants. Um, and um, and I've also with the seniors have committed to learning patois properly. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so they're telling me what I need to do in order to do this work. And um, finally, um, and you know, there's this long long term engagement with the community and with the archives, especially the ones that are um, the material ones that are going to the Clara Thomas, that I continue to be a part of that process, continue to involve the community. So for um, this morning, I was just at the Clara Thomas archives, um, communicating with a community member about particular photos where this was done. And, and so it's just all um, time consuming and so worthwhile and uh, very, very rich. And then this idea of future now from Andrew Davis, thinking about um, what are the point of these records for future generations um, as we continue to live through and navigate racial capital systems, um, which include our archival systems that are predisposed to Black and, and Indigenous dispossession and that. Uh, so future now helps me to think about creatively creating the future and the present rather than waiting for that change, freedom, and justice to come. In terms of archival justice, I'm proposing to do that through the cinematic arts. Um, for my research, this means reimagining and co-creating the archive, um, um, which includes the container that it's going to be in, <laughs> um, the procedures, the processes, as well as the access, questioning every aspect of that and um, asking for feedback from the community. Um, yeah, so creating that future archive now. I may be going over time. So this leads to my methodology, which is research creation. And um, and I, I don't have any photos from the focus groups, except for the heritage singers, which is more public, but from the ones that are community members, um, they're on film still, like 60 millimeter film, I still need to digitize them. Plus I haven't gone back to the community members to get you know, just to vet the pictures, they, it's okay to show. So I just gleaned these off the internet, but this is an image of um, three Jamaican businesses in Shelburne as African Caribbean uh, grocery store, um, smoothie shop and a coffee shop. And um, so for those of you who don't know, it's in Dufferin County, which is like in country town, north of Toronto. And so uh, Dufferin and Simcoe counties are one of the focus groups. And, um, and they were very much interested in relaying their oral histories and grateful for the space to talk about Jamaican culture as distinct from other black communities. And also really concerned about what happens afterwards with these archives, what access will be built into the project. <clears throat> and that's a question that keeps coming up. Um, the second focus group, was, which I've just started working with, is the Jamaican Canadian Association Seniors Group. So there's a long history of the JC that intertwines through several stories of the participants, one of whom is here from, um, you know, the JCA started in her living room. And then um, at the seniors group, uh, if I may <laughs> say, yeah, I don't know if I should say your name, uh, but yeah, so, um, 
it, this has been a link through it, a thread throughout the community that's been very important. And um, so I've recorded a few oral histories there and filmed a little bit. And uh, mostly we printed out cell phone pictures on archival quality paper and ink. So it's a little uh, cell phone printer, but it's like very high quality prints and just giving, um, you know, you know, seniors could, they're used to having something in their hand so they could take it from their phone and they could take it away with them, which was just really nice. That was just yesterday, I think. Um, and I have uh, someone who's helping me with that, Sonia Mwambu, the filmmaker. And then the final focus group that I'm mostly gonna talk about is, um, or that I mostly have the records of because it's almost complete, is the Heritage Singers. Um, and um, and their phone is now at the, the, the Clara Thomas. And I've been digitizing with uh, Cinemobilia. Um, they've done all the digitizing for free. <laughs> And it, that's with the Archive Counter Archive here at York, um, which would have been very expensive. And what, why I, I'm really interested in heritage singers is because I see them as this link um, from the folk uh, traditions, uh, songs and movements to the present, like, you know, to, from, to reggae, like the, from, if we go from the rhythm is like mento, ska, reggae, and dance hall, and, whatever contemporary music is now, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so uh, they're kind of this link that they brought to Canada, which I just find very interesting. And they're preserving a largely creolized African heritage. Um, that's, uh, uh, you know, others in Jamaica who performed these were like Louise Bennett Coverley, um, Miss Lou, Olive Lewin, Rex Nettleford. And they're doing this here. Um, and so one of my other motivations for approaching them was because I had a hunch that they might have audio visual records because I'd been to one of their performances and they were taping it. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll ask. And uh, they had they had so much there. So their cassettes of rehearsals, um, radio interviews, a documentary, a CBC documentary um, that they had done, uh, demo tapes for, and professional recordings. And there were also at least 50 VHS tapes, if not more, including many movies taped from TV or bought from the video store, as well as a good 30 tapes of just the performances. They've, um, they've been around for almost 50 years now. Amongst the surprises in the collection of the tapes were a ceremony dedicated to Black women in the church at St. Paul's Anglican Church, an educational video intended for Black women in Toronto and hosted by Ms. Liu on cervical cancer, a recording of Robert Owen, a Black opera singer with the Canadian Opera Company, singing with Leanne Lyons, her daughter, and, um, oh, Grace Lyons' daughter, who's the founder. And then there's just the riches of figuring out who's in the audiences, um, and, you know, spanning from the 1980s to the 2000s. Um, oh, and, and I have a video here. <laughs>
Yeah, so you can see a lot of the gestures. Um, the music has been influenced by classical music. So there's these interpretations going on. They've made all the costumes based on um, traditional uh, wear, but they've put their own uh, artistic uh, uh, um, vision into it. Uh, the choreography are based on ordinary gestures. So um, yeah, I just find it lovely. And that was just, um, but you can see that the quality um, is changing over time. Like it's not that good. And there's some where you, you just have a lot of like lines going across and they're deteriorating over time. So if they aren't digitized, there's no way to be watching any of this. Um, and so now in terms of um, what I'm also doing is, um, with the filming on 16 millimeter, I'm using a methodology called um, process cinema. So I'm using a Bolex camera and I'm filming, and maybe somebody could let me know how the time's going. <laughs> I'm using a Bolex camera. Uh, it's a wind up camera. It's completely like non digital or electrical. And, um, and it, when I, one thing I can do is I can process those, that film with plants. So in some of the discussions, we're talking about um, what are in the, uh, what folks are growing in their gardens, um, the medicines that they know still know about. Most have lost that medicinal knowledge, and I think that's both here and in Jamaica. Um, and um, and also like celebrations. So sorrel is um, another one. So I can actually get the image using the plants. Like get the image off the film using the plants instead of chemical um, developers. It's it's using the flowers and some vitamin C and washing soda, and then I can develop the plant. And so I'm thinking of that as um, remediation, um, thinking about um, remedies <laughs> uh, to um, heal historical traumas, like, you know, conceptually or even actually, uh, like a tea, a push tease on on the image, um, and so this is um, this is kind of what it looks like here. Uh, that's I think that was cedar. This was just in the project I did with Damon Runners, and then you can um, that that's a phytogram, and here's um, another way of working with the the flowers. Is, and I'm going to come back to the communities and have other workshops where we're going to make these things called phytograms. And so it's maybe bringing, um, assembling these flowers that we've spoken about in the oral history recordings, coming back and then putting them on the film and then layering them over the image. So in the installation, it's not going to be um, like a linear film. It's going to be um, a number of like many, many different images. And then just the swash of medicine over it. Um, yeah. So I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can talk about more in the Q&A with that. Um, and then just finally, uh, thinking about access, especially uh, in Dufferin and Simcoe counties, as well as the seniors group, uh, how are we going to access the archives? A lot of researchers go um, to the seniors group and they never come back and they never know what's happened to them. And I said, well, we're going to have an exhibition and it's going to be right here. <laughs> and so they're really happy about that. And so I'm figuring out um, in terms of mobility, how will these archives move around? That this container for the archives, these digital archives, how will it move around um, so that we can show it in a gallery in a community space at the Shelburne block party, for instance. Um, so that's one thing that I'm working through. The other is um, the, the physical archives and accessibility. Um, um, I was, there are some folks who had um, archives taken, um, who had brought their archives to the Museum of Dufferin for an exhibition. And um, some of them were not returned, others were damaged. Um, so, you know, that kind of care wasn't there. So um, how can you make, make the physical archives physically accessible to folks um, without, with, with that kind of care. And then finally, uh, digital futures, thinking about um, uh, a website. Uh, this came up in the Dufferin Shelburne group, uh, Dufferin Simcoe County group, um, building a website as a future archives that will link metadata of Jamaican archives dispersed throughout the world, because this is 
just one little small project. Um, and also thinking about how would you access a digital archive in the future? Um, thinking about a different kind of a search tool, can it be done with movement? Um, so working on a preliminary um, tool right now with uh, Professor Patrizio Davila as a proposition for a future speculative archive. Um, yeah, and then I just, so that's basically it. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Vanny Canada Scholarships, Archive Canada Archive, um, Melissa Nelson, Katrina Palacios Cohen, who are both archivists and who guided me through the early stages of the process. And Michael Moyer, who's a head archivist at Claire Thomas and Isabel, whose last name I do not have, uh, for the work that they're currently doing at the archives here. And especially to the Harriet Tubman Institute, um, I received a seed fund of $2,500, which helped me um, to pay the honoraria, purchase the food and buy some equipment um, you know, that photo, that selfie photograph um, printer that you can print your cell phone pictures off. So that's been just tremendous in terms of um, giving back to the community. And um, and all of the participants have said to me, they would have done this uh, for free. Why am I paying them? And I tell them, no, this is a small token of the knowledge you are sharing with me and with future generations. This is, is worth something far more than the money and the food it is but a pittance in terms of the value of what you have to offer. And so I say to them, thank you for keeping that knowledge. Thank you for trusting me enough to share it. So, and I have lots of other things I could show as well, but we can go on to the Q&A. Anybody had any questions? Well, we could begin in here. The digital world can wait, but um, thank you so much. I'll I'll, I'll begin. Um, wow, such rich research, and it's funny because I didn't know like a lot of your. I mean, you learned a little bit of music, but like, wow, this is such important work too, in terms of the preservation and uh, the curation of it um, and to think about it through a lens of future now, sort of thinking of it, a lens of futurity it is really um, something quite precious and um, really counter logics of not only colonial archive, but like neoliberal understanding of the past that is so consumable in, in, a, in a way. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still sort of thinking about um, all of that. I did have like a quick question that'll like lead me to like a deeper question. So um, the fiddle grant that you are uh, creating, the plants that you're using, uh, are they indigenous to Jamaica or to Canada or what's the origin of the plants? Yeah, so they're gleaned from the oral histories. <laughs> um, and so one of, uh, there will probably be ganja in there. Um, one is sorrel, which uh, we drink at Christmas time. And actually, the proprietor of the Africa Caribbean uh, store that I showed you mm -hmm. earlier just called me this morning saying, We have fresh sorrel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, thank you. They were reading my mind. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I've worked with that before to develop the film, but also to place on the film uh, spidergrams. Um, uh, I think there's one participant who has uh, guava in her garden. Um, so there's a lot of Caribbean um, flowers and plants, um, but there's also, you know, there's one senior who's a gardener and his wife had died and so he continues the garden and so there's the butterfly fly plant that he loves which is um it's grown here I don't know where it's indigenous to but it's grown here so it's it comes from the stories okay um so that that even informs my question my my wider question of it um because you know when you uh, stated in the beginning of the of the presentation that you use Davis work and uh, Horizons to make sound, um, it has me thinking of the ritual in which you're thinking about 
uh, diaspora and links to Black and Indigenous people and different sort of uh, understanding of a wider framework of who's considered Caribbean and you shared your heritage too. So uh, how does uh, the use of the plant like widen that frame of like who uh, who are we representing? How are we talking about uh, belonging and how, uh, yeah, I think there's something sort of synchronous that's happening with the plant, the story and, and how that relates to sort of the, the subject matter or the subject spirit. Yeah, so one of the things I'm thinking about is like tobacco is an ROF word, right? And um, that's a sacred medicine here. Um, so that might come into it. Like in process cinema and also in indigenous methodologies, and I think also in Caribbean ways of viewing the world, it's not just the human. Um, so the plants have their own narrative and they put that in. Um, I'm not in control of everything and the humans aren't in control of everything. Um, and I think that's that's part of it. It's not necessarily um, bringing Indigenous and, and, um, and Black Caribbean people together. Like that's um, that's not this project. I do that in my other work with O'Damon Runners. Um, but in this work, it's really just thinking about um, one's place here and what that means. And um, I'm not gonna force somebody to think um, in a certain way, it just comes. And, you know, some of the conversations, a lot of it um, hasn't really touched upon being on indigenous land, but um, in the older generations, but certainly in my generation, that's come up in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of, how I think that's something to work out. I don't think we're yeah. anywhere near there. That's something we're working out. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just make a comment. Um, several years ago, maybe before you were born, uh, in uh, was it? I, uh, Dominican Republic or no, it's not Cuba. I had the Dominican Republic or in Puerto Rico, there was a huge conference on plants and medicines and stuff like that. Um, I have to say, from my knowledge, uh, in the Caribbean, yeah, there is a blend between the African and the indigenous. Mm -hmm. You can't really separate them, okay, from, from the rest of us. Um, and so they made, a, they had a book, which my brother had and the hurricane took it away. Um, I will try to find it from him where he thinks he could track that down. Mm -hmm. Because what was happening, a, a lot of our people were, our old people, older people who were dying and the information was disappearing. Really? Yeah. So for example, in his backyard, he grows beef of life and beven, I guess the English call it vein, um, comfrey, all that sort of stuff. And that's what he uses to heal himself. He's a lawyer. He uses that, and he has taught his kids that. In St. Lucia, there's a Rastafari brethren who has a clinic, and all he uses is hers. Uh, his information, I can send you. One of my big peeps at this. Okay. <laughs> um, because um, my brother sent that to me for a, a friend in St. Lucia, so I can give you that. Oh. But the other one is really important. I remember my father saying that one of the people who worked on our land, his mother was in hospital. And to get out of hospital, and I'm talking about ancient times, <laughs> um, he, the, the, the overseer had to have daddy sign for her to come out of the hospital. She came out of the hospital and around two weeks afterwards, after being them saying, we can't do anything for her. She walked, she walked into daddy's place and said, Bushi Harris. And he said, okay, what's going on? He had been healed by she the old people. So there's a lot of that that still goes on that a lot of people call Obia and it has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, I know, for example, years ago in Jamaica in the 90s, two professors uh, explored the marijuana plant the ganja plant, because they noticed the, 
their country people didn't get glaucoma for some strange reason, but all their patients from town and the city got glaucoma. And so they called them in and they said, well, where were you born? Are you, are you Jamaican for real? And you're asking us this? And they gave them the information they had from all. They explored it. And there is for years now in Jamaica, drops, glaucoma drops made with marijuana that you can complete, they can prescribe it for you. So there's a lot of that still taking place. Um, I come from Dominica, my son Dominique, my mother's Jamaica and my father Dominican. And so we still have the original people. In fact, our president is a woman uh, of, from the from the Kalinago people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have a Ministry of Kalinago Affairs. So there's a lot. That's why I'm very conscious of the fact that we, we don't separate the Kalinago people from the African people. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's also true in the food, right? Oh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So th there are those blends. I was thinking more Indigenous here and, uh, and okay. there. Um, and I'm also interested in what people have retained here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think there's been a lot more loss, but, but folks and some of the participants, as well as myself and my mom, are trying to, um, you know, regain that knowledge. Yes. yes. Um, we just have our hands. Uh, online. Shaughnessy, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> Her mom and brother are part of this project. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your, sharing your wonderful and brilliant work with us. I have a question about your earlier talk when you're mentioning your understanding of the archives being material or embodied. I wondered if you could talk more about just how your understanding of archives operate? Like, is there some aspects that allow more for more flexibility than others in terms of that distinction you're making between the material and embodied? Can you say more, please? Okay, <laughs> thank you for the question, Dr. Brown. Um, yeah, the, so I, I think of it more as a continuum. So there's text, there's photographs, there's audiovisual, there's the body. Um, and the body has different ways of recording. Like I actually think of the body almost as an audiovisual recorder. Um, so um, for me, it's also material, if that makes sense. Um, but that could be too conceptual. Uh, and I just think it's it's more material for cultures that have an oral tradition um, than than ones that don't so much. I, I think all have some sort of oral. Um, practices, but I think it's really important in ours. And I think we especially see that in the dance um, and also in some of the gestures from the heritage singers as well. And they're not, and it doesn't necessarily have to have meaning. I mean, you can look at a, a textual archive, a piece of paper, and you'll have, have no idea what this means in the archives. And it's, it's the same with a gesture or a, a movement. You might not know what it means, but if you, if you can kind of start to to dig a little deeper, maybe you can find that meaning. Uh, maybe. Uh, that answers your question. Sure does. Thank you. Clifton. <laughs> Clifton. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Zoom Zoo Zoo always messed me up when they start clicking. Uh, I hear you. Uh, fascinating talk, enthralling. Um, um, I guess I should, full, false confession, I'm sort of small part of the project, so excited to work on uh, with Debbie on this. I made a comment in the chat that it's such impactful and insightful work. And every time I just hear you speak about this, I'm just full of gratitude and appreciation that you're telling our stories. You know, one thing, I take a lot of the history classes, and one thing we always say is, if you don't tell your own stories, then someone else will. And uh, so I'm very grateful that, uh, Debbie, that you've taken on, on this project. So for us undergraduate people, I'm fascinated to know who aspire possibly to do this type of work in the future. What are some of the challenges that you've come across, especially dealing with such a wide section of our, our, of our diaspora over Canada, um, throughout the Caribbean? I know you've been on this project for a while. Can you just talk about some of the challenges and uh, roadblocks that you faced along the way? And that's sort of fascinating to me. Yeah, well, the first is just I'm a pretty shy person. Oh, and Melody Brown is here. <laughs> Hello, Melody. She's also part of the project. 
Um, and a medicine woman, <laughs> bush, bush, bush tea galore. Um, Clifton, thank you for the question. There have been the biggest challenge was just um, doing a project with my own community. Um, like I've worked with other <laughs> other um, communities before, and it seems a little easier to be a little bit distant from it, but there's way more responsibility, personal responsibility you have when it's your own community to do things right. And people will tell you when you haven't done something right. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that, that was really, uh, that part was difficult. But then once um, I just set my mind to it and started making inquiries, um, you know, people started to, to respond to it. Um, the seniors, there are some, because it's a big group, so I didn't um, recruit them. I went to them. Some are, yeah, gung-ho. Others are very hesitant, and that's okay. Like, why should I share my story with you? I'm, I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, and so it, it's just being respectful, respectful for just whoever wants to participate. Like, I think that choice is really um, important. And the other is just financial. So I, and that's why I keep going back to, uh, you know, the seed fund from HTI. Um, it's important for me to give honoraria to folks. Um, I'm, um, you know, I'm a, a curator and a directed a film festival or co-directed a film festival and paying artists um, is is what's ethical and it's to my it's just to my core and so um, paying participants <laughs> is is part of that they're they're the artists they're the they're the ones with knowledge so um, it, it's it's just I, I just have to keep hustling applying for more funds here and there and that's what I do so those are those are most of the challenges and the other is just like working with analog film like a technical challenge like that so I have um I couldn't I found that I couldn't do everything all at the same time have conversation with somebody and film so I've hired um somebody who's really an expert in filmmaking Sonia Mambu um and and she does the filming um and she's just great she's from you got oh, her parents are from uganda or her mother is um and what's really interesting are she's like oh but this just sounds like my culture or this is just like we do. And, and it was it's just so funny because she's laughing the whole time about the similarities um so i think that's really interesting we haven't had any time to unpack that but one day we're gonna have coffee and just sort of unpack everything I want to say quickly, it's amazing how it's always your own people are the hardest to please, <laughs> also, but you're also the most demanding of yourself at the, at, the, at the same time. So such respect, such appreciation, and look forward to you um, more work from this uh, project. And as I say, keep on keeping on, Debbie. So proud of you. So thanks for taking my question. Thank you, Clifton. You're amazing. Oh, yeah. Fascinating work. I'm so excited for, for what you've been doing and what you'll produce. I'm curious about the different Jamaicans that you are meeting in the archives. Because I think sometimes when we talk about diaspora, there it's sort of flattened as if diaspora is just one and we all get along. So I'm I'm curious to hear more about sort of the different versions of Jamaica you're meeting in the archives. Yeah, so some of the, some folks um, came, uh, were born here. That's a different Jamaica. <laughs> um, uh, different memories um, and uh, different experiences. Um, and I'm hesitant to talk about individual participants until I've gone back to them with, with what, so um, that's why I'm kind of hesitating. Um, different parts of the island. So I've learned about different dialects. I just thought there was Papua. I didn't know there were different dialects. Um, there are different shades, <laughs> all different shades. Um, I have, and of course, um, I haven't gone so much into the Chinese, Jamaican Chinese. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have some records from my family. I could even play some, <laughs> uh, like Chinese records, but uh, this, cause, because for me, it's important, you know, where is this culture rooted in? And it's really rooted in those African traditions that have come here, as well as Indigenous 
traditions that have sort of been mixed in and then all the others have come into there but it, it is these african there's this african base and so that's where i'm starting um and then you know everybody has you know there are a lot of folks with you know the united nations as their family <laughs> which is what one uh, one of the seniors just told me like my my family was the united nations so, um, and in terms of class, there are some who are highly educated, like with PhDs um, um, and university degrees and others, not so much. Like it's it's just right across the board. Have you met any politics folks? Because it's very interesting when I, I meet Jamaicans in the diaspora who they'll say, oh, I, I left Jamaica and I've never been back. And I go, oh, did you leave in the 70s? And they say yes, I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah. so yeah. you yeah. you left for a particular reason and so Jamaica has this space in your mind, but that's not, I don't talk politics. Yeah. You know, the, and, and one of the, one of the purchase seniors said, you know, um JLP or PNP mid up here. Like it, it's just just avoid that. That's somebody else's project. <laughs> and I have researched uh politics of Jamaica in the past, so that's not where I'm at either. Um I just want to um sort of make sure that people have their stories recorded and if politics comes into that, you know, that's up to them. Okay. I, I have a question as well. Um I'm Keisha by the way. Hi, Great to yeah. hear you. So I'm I'm doing research, but I'm in the music and my research is going to involve getting into the archives and I'm researching um like Canadian jazz musicians. I mean it's the broader topic is around whiteness and jazz, but it's going to involve Black Canadian jazz musicians. And I'm interested in the counter archive, like who's in the background, but that's another thing. Um, but I'm also interested in Jamaican music and I've been, I've done research, like my side project is always something to do with Jamaican music. And um, anyways, this summer, and I'm, I'm all over the place and I'm just going to apologize because <laughs> my brain is going We need to talk. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, you know, you know, like I did, I was born in Jamaica. I was there till I was um, almost 14 and I came here and, you know, every time like there, there comes a point where um, and I wrote about it in that piece, like my body just like, okay, I need to go, I need to go to Jamaica. So <laughs> anyway, so I ended up, my aunt lives in Fort Moore. She lives near Spanish town. So I went to the archives, never been to the archives. I'm like, I'm just going to go. And I, it's time to go. Oh, <laughs> so my question is like, how do you, so I went and I was only there for two hours and I'm like, this is not enough. And, and the ladies, she was so nice and helpful and they were wonderful there. But she was like, well, what do you want to look at? I'm like, I don't know. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we I started with a folder um because um, part of my heritage is from India. I like indentured servants. So I was like, I want to see, you you know. And, you, and then you get this log from like 1911 of people, not even of the people of like 18, men and whatever. It's all like, I, I was reading this and I was getting really emotional because it was like, so you talked about the colonial archive and I'm like, it's like coconuts, you know, 12 bananas and 14 coconuts and this one died, you know? And, and, and so it's just like, there's that part because you, you're still a human being and, and I'm like, these are human beings. But anyway, so I guess my longer question is like, how do you, how do you know where to start, right? Like I know the musician, he has a fond here, Archeline, so that's fine. But you know, there's this idea of if it's a colonial archive and there's like a counter archive, if I don't know who I'm looking for, how am I gonna find somebody that I want? Or how am I gonna find that information I want if the, the representation is not through somebody whose body was like mine? So I, I don't know. <laughs> Make that people up. <laughs> That's literally where I started. Yeah. Like I haven't even been to the archives really. I've seen some in the Clara Thomas archives and there's some um, notations of some of the folk songs that map on to heritage singers, but it's somebody else. So I want to go back to that. And, and then I'm going to relate it to the stories. Right. Right. So I'm starting with the people. Monty Alexander, he lived in Dufferin County. I know exactly where his house was. I don't know him personally. I just know the story, the stories around the community. Oh. It's a completely white community, but they're like, did you know that Monty Alexander lived here? <laughs> See? <laughs> That's exactly how it works. <laughs> okay, all right. This is a bigger conversation. <laughs> no, no, no. 
I one thing I did find musically is I ended up. It turns out, you know, Jamaica School of Music. What's that? Talk about colonial archives. Mm -hmm. Fascinating because it was really just somebody donated all these letters. There was some musician or some. He had a shop in Kingston. I think he sold sheet music at the turn of the century. But he had a relationship with the Maroons in Wartown, and he was trying to compile a book of Maroon songs. Whoa! And so, but so he's got more lyrics, and then he's got sort of like solfege, but there's no rhythm. So, anyways, I, I'd nice. like to go back. My goal yeah. is to find my way back and just like yeah. camp out at the archives for a couple of days. But yeah, so so it it really looks like it will be a really great activity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. for your work um i think what i'm interested in, in is children i wonder how if children show up in the stories how are you planning to archive children do they only show up in the you know folks's memories like i know you talk a lot about the future is it just something that you're doing for the future with the children or I, i'm just wondering how do they show up yeah that's a really great question. So because I've limited this this sort of time periods, 60s to the 80s, but it's also um, goes in both directions. Um, there are younger people uh, involved, but mostly um, it's folks um, who are older that I'm just just making sure, like hoping I can um, that their knowledge is recorded. Um, but I've also been thinking about in terms of the access, when the access comes in. So yes, as users, but, um, and I, I have to go back to the participants with this idea. So I'm a little bit hesitant, I'm going to put it out there anyway. But one thing that we've been talking about in, in the different Simcoe County groups is uh, going to the block party. So I'm thinking like, what does a workshop look like there where the children are making maybe vitagrams? Um, they're going around with the wind up camera and, and filming. So. You know, it, and this is, it's not just like this ends with this project. Like, I'm just this kind of person that I, you know, I'm, I'm still in touch with communities I've been working with like five, six years ago. And this is my own community. So it's just going to keep going. Um, I, I think also uh, outside of that, I'm wondering in terms of children showing up is like within those stories, they're talking about themselves as children. Right. How, what does that look like? That's a really great question, and maybe that's something I need to look into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mohammed. Are you muted? <laughs> Sorry about that. And thank you so much, um, Debbie, for uh, your presentation. I want to echo the um, sentiment um, of... Um, 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 others um, about the uh, value of the work that um, you you are, you are doing. Um, it's, it's really um, amazing work. Um, I I have two questions. Although I was almost going to change my mind about the first question uh, when you responded to a previous question by saying that it is um, another person's project. Um, I I was I'm interested in um, some of the stories um, that um, you see in this project coming together, specifically the struggles of, um, of Jamaicans um, in the diaspora, uh, specifically in, in, in Canada. Um, what are you seeing as um, the emerging um, portrait um, of people's um, struggles, um, even if it is personal, but is there anything that is coming together for you? Uh, the uh, second question is, um, was there any um, archival evidence you were looking for that um, you were unable to find? And what creative means um, were you able to put together to account for that? Okay, great questions. Okay, so the first question, the, the, the sort of portrait that's emerging, um, let's call it a general portrait. Um, and I need to go back to the participants to talk about any specific story in particular. Um, but there's the general um, portrait, and this is this is also hard, you know. Like there's the self care, um, but to hold these stories, like the separation of families, um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, the separation of families, the separation of families, the separation of families. 
um, also racism, like finding housing, finding jobs, doors shut in the face. Oh, we already rented it. Um, we've already hired somebody. Uh, no, we won't hire you. Um, those kinds of stories, but also such resilience and an F you kind of attitude as well. Um, and, and just going and not even an F you kind of attitude. It's more like, I'm going to do, I came here to do something and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to find a way to do it. I don't even call that resilience. I just stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an element of stubbornness. And, 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 my, my, there's ambition too, but it, there's some, I don't know how to call that, but there's, um, I'm going to do it and I'm going to find a way to do it. Um, there's that. Um, so to the second determination, thank you, Sean. <laughs> determination. Uh, the second question, is there an archival, um, you, I guess you're thinking of documents, textual documents that I haven't been able to find. Um, so far I've been able to find the ones, I think there's one I'm looking for, but I can't recall it right now. But um, one was the policy on domestic um, uh, domestic workers here. So I found that in the digitized records at Library and Archives Canada. And I have a way that I'm going to present that in uh, in the installation. Um, and there'll be, it'll be an audio installation as well. So there, we will be hearing those stories at the same time um, as we see images. So, um, but I can't remember the one that I can't find right now. <laughs> Sorry, Mohammed. thank you for your questions. Appreciate them. Oh, what? Call it. Uh, my question is surrounding Mr. Mohammed that you see participants, like did it feel like the uh, food or other the honorarians and like would and they're working during the week and they're working with indigenous people who they, you know, the outside you know, they struggle with that. Um, I was wondering if there's this lack of a tradition or maybe thought put into what type of offering you should be giving. Like, I'm, I think maybe asking what do you see like as an offering? Like, for people to think about what, or what I actually want. Yeah. Right? I think people maybe not they don't have a tradition of like asking for offerings. They don't even know what what to think that that would be like to me. Whether it's like you know maybe a plant that you grew or like a medicine mm -hmm. um, that you can offer them or for the family or something like that. I think that I just it just made me think about you know when you are participating, how can I ask them? And if they don't have an answer, maybe tell them what to think about. I love that. I love that, and I didn't think of that. Um, but the seniors group, the coordinator, Pamela Reynolds, um, she sort of is doing that with me. So I'm donating to the seniors group, and then she's going to have a discussion with them. How to use that plan? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't even know how it's going to get used. You know, maybe they go on a trip with that. Um, with the others, <laughs> too late. <laughs> mm -hmm. But <laughs> I wish I had thought of that. You know, I really wish I had thought of that. Yeah. Because even when you offer food, it's like maybe not, it's maybe it's food people don't want to eat, you yeah. know? So um, thank you for that, Paula. I'm going to take that and um, bring it forward. I think if you ask enough people and like maybe the common thing, common thread come up, yeah. and if there's something meaningful that you can do for yourself, then yeah. um, maybe it might be something. And then maybe that's. Or maybe it's all different. Yeah, that's okay too. Yeah, thank you for that. Hello. Well, so I know I probably like to be this late, but <laughs> in terms of like what I've engaged in the discussion, um, what I would say, and I'm not sure if you discussed this ethics, how would this move over the ethics of the storytelling? It goes back to Peter's um, uh, initial um, diatorcness of like the identity and also. <laughs> yeah, um, with the children and all that stuff, how do you manage different storytelling and the ethics that are involved in that? If you sign something, how do you go back to that then? Because I know it's paperwork initially. So yeah. how do you maneuver certain types of information that's shared? Yeah, so um, they've all signed an informed consent form that they have all that 
and I haven't done it for children. So that's the other reason. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe it's after the project, take it back to the children. <laughs> after the dissertation, I don't know. Um, and uh, so then the next is to go, and, and it's continued consent. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, um, I'll go back. If I consider the images, they can digitize, can I share these? Um, and then when I start writing, um, does this represent what you said? Um, may I use these quotes in the audio installation that you did? Those kinds of things um, that you know are down the road right now, just the initial recording. And it's this cool because I'm interested in this because she likes this because um, my project is she because I want to do it as well as do well storytelling. Mm -hmm. And this is like into identity issues. So um, my question is like how do you contribute to the essence? Like if you're redacting and you have like this idea in mind, how do you keep it authentic to your research but also to their vision as well? I'm just I'm just asking, I'm not sure if you could Yeah, I think mine is really open ended. Okay. Like it's yeah. it's it's the assemblage of the archive itself that is the project. And it's the participants defining what that archive is. So it's kind of really open ended. And I think that's the beauty of research creation. Like I don't have to be I'm not the expert in the room at all. Um so um that that problem doesn't really come up for me. No, you said not the expert, so that's good. Oh, okay. That's the key, yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, that just sums it up for me right there. All right, okay. <laughs> um, so we have two, or one question um, in the chat for one participant. So the question is, how does your work intersect with the preservation of intergenerational transfer of Patois in the second generation, Canadian form for your children? Yeah, it does with the audiovisual recordings, um, and especially the heritage singers. Um, um, but it's not really looking at the language itself; it's just whatever comes up. But um, so in the folk songs, there's like an older pop one. <laughs> um, mostly, folks are speaking in English, and probably it's because I don't speak Patwa fluently. But you know, Patwa words will come in here and there. Um, so it is kind of a, so these recordings will be a document of where we're at right now, which is also part of the point is what are our archives at this moment. Um, and so that's how it intersects with the language. There is a, a researcher I've been in contact with that Melissa Nelson, the archivist at Ontario Archives, um, put me in touch with, she's coming from England and is exactly looking at the language and how it is in different diasporic spaces. So she's looked at it in England, um, is coming to Toronto for about a year, I think she's saying. She's going to Jamaica as well. And I don't know if they're, if she's going to the States, but she's actually sort of tracing the language in the diasporic spaces. Oh, I, I, around Papua, because I because when I was growing up and like my generation and before, like you wouldn't even call it a language, right? So there's that kind of politics and then even when I was there recently, a couple, so my, I'm finding like my aunt and my cousin are in academia and I feel like academics really embrace Patwa and they use it. Like my aunt was saying, like she uses Patwa and I, I'm like you, I can't, even though I was there, I can't speak it and I have to put words together because I speak French and Spanish and I treat Patwa the same way. Like I have to yeah. put a word, a sentence together. So I really, I'm not good. But, but then I went on this tour with just like a regular kind of middle class couple and, and they had that that attitude that I was familiar with, where about kind of more disparaging towards right, right. So I'm curious if that's something they encounter because the generation that is now the senior here yeah. is from that. So I grew up in that, um, although they all, all my parents, like not my dad, but my mom, my grandmother, like everybody here spoke Pakwa, but we weren't allowed to. I think they were just worried about us assimilating. Um, so, but I haven't really encountered that. In fact, when I said to the seniors that I couldn't speak Patwa, one of them really admonished me. She says, my grandson, born here, <laughs> and he can speak it. <laughs> Same. Same. Yeah, so, yeah. That's Actually, I'm, it's on language I'm going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's either last year or the year before. It was legally stated that it's not a backbite, it's a language. And there's a book out 
actually I wrote a chapter in that book. Um, and it was spawned from a discussion with Miss Lou. Um, well, you know, Miss Lou, all, all the guys, Bob Marty and so on, would come out and give her praise for dealing with the language. And she used to say, what well, make it when they do it is derived from, when we do is a corruption of, which is what mm -hmm. Patwa means. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole Caribbean has dealt with that. So our language in Dominica has been deemed a language along with Haiti, St. Lucie, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Haiti, St. Martin. And we have a whole commission with the African countries that were colonized. Um, and so we refer to it as a language. Um, and so for me, it's really important for us to start referring to the Jamaican language as the language, mm -hmm. right. because it was born the same time as Africans. Africans is referred to as a language. Right, right. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> and ours because people feel it is derived from African languages mm -hmm. must be put down and it's unfortunate that they have so corrupted our minds that we are now doing the their work yeah. Yeah. by putting it down yeah. um, so I, that for me that is, is very so very you call it a Jamaican language it's a Jamaican language it's not a but, but what do you call it but it's it's not, it's now it's not a T W A. so it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's and I've been really admonished helps. for that oh because yeah. they want to use the French so why do we have to change everything <laughs> yeah. like how we spell it. so there is a tension in the community um and you know I'm with you that it is a language but I'm not going to impose that you can't impose it I'm just saying yeah. that in to me, in records, it needs to be referred to as a language. Yeah. And it is taught here at university. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Okay, it's yeah. taught as a language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think we need to start dealing with that. Uh, Koyal, which is K-W-Y-O-L, uh, in Dominica was referred to as a patois. And a lot of the older people you find here, I'm 76, a lot of the people my age and a little younger and older would say patois. <laughs> And I become a thorn in their side. Because every time they see that way, I stop them. I want to talk to my parents. Well, sure, I will. Rich. No, no, I'm sure. I will. My mother tried to learn it because when she was growing up, she wasn't permitted to even go to the kitchen. Okay? But her mother was a renegade. <laughs> and so they learned all the songs. They knew all the songs because that was the culture. And so when she married my father and came to Dominica, she got a book from the snow. London. So when they said, because in Dominica we're very queer. Mm -hmm. So there's a day when all the kids go in our traditional dress and you're not allowed to speak any language but the queer language. And we have stations that only speak the language. And it's very prevalent. Right? Our, our, our soup and everything is queer. Um, so for her, when they begin to speak queer, and my mom's fluent in queer with really two years, she had to learn it. Otherwise, what would happen? <laughs> And she would tease and she would speak Jamaican. You know, although she was really queer, she said, Well, I'm Jamaican, so you ask me for my language, so I'm going to speak it. You know, and the others would laugh, her friends would, would laugh and, and, you know, deal with that. And a lot of Jamaican ladies were married to our doctors <laughs> uh, because they went to university in Jamaica. And so they, they had their group. You know, some of them still were being stocious, you know, <laughs> but my mother was like known all over the island. She, she spoke, it was going to be okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I think we ourselves have to push that. I don't speak it, but I understand it completely. Yeah, yeah I do speak the Creole from Dominica because that was raised there. Um, but I think it's something we ourselves have to liberate our mind, yeah. like Brian said, okay. you know, and deal with it. and try to reason with some of the older people and let them see where it came from. If we just say we want to speak it. Right. If we talk to them about where it came from, why we think so, that might, they might begin to calm down. But then don't you have like the whole politics of respectability? Yeah, I mean respect. Okay, I'll just declare. I come from an upper class family in Dominica. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with that on the side. Um, my mother referred to herself as black. Freaked out all her friends, but they dared not say anything. <laughs> She said, as a black woman, I'm going to say so much less like, okay, all right? So they, they respected that. And I think it takes, there was a lady called Sissy Cordero who was like Louise Bennett. She was from that prominent family. She taught 
literally thousands of girls where she taught us all, all the dances mm -hmm. and we used to do big celebrations. She wrote operettas for the people in, in some of the areas that couldn't speak the Quail yet. Um, but it was spoken in a dialect English and the, all the music was done here. Um, so there are people who will take a stand and who will push it and the respectability you're talking about, hey, I'm respectable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're respectable, and I think we all are respectable, we have to be careful how we define respectability. Um, we can pass that on. Mm -hmm. We can pass that on to our children. My nephew was born here, and you ask him who is he? Says I'm Dominica. Politically, when it's necessary, he calls himself Canadian. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but if you ask him who he is, he says I'm a Dominican. Because we didn't come here as parasites, we came here to build. This is a young country, 150 years old, uh, 156. Oh. So we're here building. And if we just say, well, I'm Canadian, what is that? Has been formed here. It's being developed. We are developing. Eventually, we will have a Canadian culture. And it will be from all of us. All of us over here. We have civilized. I don't know. <laughs> I think just speaking to that, and I think what you're doing as well, um, I think there's something also like intergenerational that's bringing that up, like stories of like not, you know, foreclosing sort of a uh, language um, and then younger generation be like, no, I'm going to learn and I'm going to do it. And it's like, OK. And then and then and I think there's something continuous. I think there's like a the determination or the resilience, right? That 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 uh, is an intergenerational sort of uh, preservation in, in a sense, right? And that's pretty beautiful to see your work and what you're talking about. Speaking my personal experience speaks to a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just have one more question, which was just a follow up, um, and it was um, I wanted to get the name of the the name of the book that. Um, Someone here spoke about that they were a chapter in. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> something? Um, so someone's asking the name of the book that you wrote. Oh, I must uh, apologize. I can't remember the name. But it was put up by, by uh, York University. Okay. Is that what Michelle Johnson? Yes. Jamaican yes, I, I, um, I think it's called Jamaican Language. I, it is called Jamaican Language, but it's spelled differently. Yeah, L A N G I can't W I J or something like that. Yeah. Something like that. She, uh, she edited the book, mm -hmm. yeah, and all of the, many of us wrote. Right, Tika chapters. had a chapter in there as well. Tika's, yes, uh, yeah, Tika's well. already, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Um, Gertrude King is here, um, and Gertrude has been, I, Gertrude was probably the first person I spoke to uh, because we've known each other for quite a long time. We live out in the middle of nowhere, and, uh, well, I guess it's not in the middle of nowhere now, but, um, yeah, just uh, in very white spaces in <laughs> small town Ontario. And so when she saw this, uh, I guess I put it on Facebook. Uh, she called me up and and her family story is is really, truly amazing. And it was um, actually her, her parents' living room where the JCA started. Um, so that was really quite fascinating. I hope that's okay I shared, Gertrude, since you're here. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. <laughs>